I have to admit, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, this is the one that was a part of creation, that through and by everything was created. That he existed, that it was he that likely spoke the universe into being. This is the one that was promised to the Israelites, the one that they anticipated for generations, the one that would come and be their rescuer and conqueror. This is the one that the prophet Isaiah spoke about when he wrote this in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And it was time for his arrival. Now, truth be told, truth be told, if you or I were in charge of making the plans, it probably would have looked a lot different. Oh, we may see these uh, stories of babies being born in cars or on the way to the hospital or on the subway uh, or somewhere else. We think, wow, what a story. But that's not really something we would choose for our own kids. Just last night, I was having a conversation with my mother-in-law. We were reminiscing about the various little intricacies and quirks about when our children were born. We talked about how uh, when Nathan was being born, I was watching the Chiefs beat the Raiders 14 to 7 on the TV right there in the delivery room. It was awesome. And then how when Riley was born, as soon as she popped out, I headed out to Denny's to get some breakfast, <laughs> leaving Care there by herself. And then uh, on the way to uh, deliver Elijah, Joe stopped for Wendy's on the way. So that was fun. We talked about how uh, with, um, with Lainey, with our middle child, it was an icy day, and that happened to be the day that Carrie was staying at my mother, mother-in-law and father-in-law's house, who are here with us today. And my mother-in-law was talking about how she was praying the whole time because I was speeding as much as I could on that ice to get to the hospital. The hospital was 72 miles away, and Carrie was going into labor, and Marcia was praying that God would keep that baby inside until we got to the hospital. So it's not something we want, right? That's the, 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 even though they might look like good stories on Facebook or you know on your news feed or whatever, it, it's not something we really want. We would prefer our children being born in cozy hospitals with trained medical staff around, or very, at the very least, a calm, comfortable birth in the confines of our own home, if that's our plan. Then we want our kiddos to be safe in a crib or a nursery. We want to let everybody know, uh, everybody that we know that the child is born. And we want to put pictures on Instagram and Facebook and, of our new baby. And, and that's just for our regular run-of-the-mill kids. That, that's what we expect. That's what we want. Just our regular run-of-the-mill offspring. But what if we were in charge of the birthing plan for the Savior? Now, I will say that I like the Magi aspect of Jesus' birth. I like that part of the story. It certainly seems appropriate that wise men would come and present the infant Jesus gifts that were meant for a king, that they would await his, his arrival and they would travel for a long distance to bring him expensive uh, gifts that were meant for royalty. That makes perfect sense to me. I like that part. We can keep that part in there as far as I'm concerned. But let's talk about some of the not so appropriate aspects of Jesus' birth, if you will. I don't know about you, but if I were in charge, I'd probably switch up the announcement a little bit. I'd still use the angels. That's a good part of that. But instead of limiting the audience to a bunch of smelly shepherds, I would make that announcement so magnificent, so widespread that no human being would escape the magnitude of what had happened. That's how I would do it. I don't know about you, but if I were in charge, I'd probably switch up the town too. You know, instead of the modern-day Bevel Oaks we talked about last week, that's kind of the size of Bethlehem at the time, probably smaller. And, and I'd probably pick up a, a modern-day center of civilization, if you will, maybe something like New York or L.A., something where there could be lots of coverage. So in, in Jesus' times, maybe it'd be Jerusalem or maybe even Rome back in the day would be more appropriate for the Savior's arrival. Not to mention the accommodations. Instead of a Savior being born in the company of animals, and having a food trough for a bed, I'd probably pick the world's best hospital in the company of not only the best medical personnel in the world, but the world's most notable dignitaries with a waiting room. That's a good story, right? That this king was being born in the greatest hospital and all the, the doctors were there awaiting his arrival. And out in the waiting room were the kings and presidents and 
the, just the, the notable dignitaries of our, of our time or that time. And even better, maybe take all of that, the, the, the medical personnel and the dignitaries, take that to the most luxuri luxurious palace you can imagine, or even maybe a, a majestic cathedral. I don't know about you, but if I were in charge, I would have avoided that whole paradise or ordeal. That, that's kind of a stain on the story. If you think about it, I don't really like that very much. Something seems off about the slaughter of babies and how it's associated with the Savior and that his family had to suffer uh, to temporary exile into Egypt. That doesn't, doesn't really seem to fit. And I don't know about you, but I think the arrival of the Savior warrants all the fanfare and spectacle that heaven can muster. I wasn't in charge. God the Father was in charge. And the Savior's arrival was not loud and spectacular because perhaps that just isn't the kind of Savior he is. This is what the Apostle John says about his arrival in John chapter 1, verse 14. He says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is probably the most beautiful and succinct description of the arrival of Jesus because it wraps up so many amazing truths in just a few words. He starts out by saying, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And that speaks to the eternal nature of who Jesus is. Remember, the beginning of this chapter says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And so that brings in the internal nature of Jesus, of who He is, and His incredible decision to become a human being for the sake of human beings. I didn't have a choice in my birth. I know you didn't either. You didn't decide to be born in what circumstances. But Jesus made a conscious and willful decision to forego His place in heaven and temporarily so that human history might be altered for eternity. Now, the we in this passage, we have seen his glory, that most likely refers to the disciples. That John is speaking as the apostle John is saying that we as Jesus' disciples, those of us who followed him around for about three years, who were with him all the time, who were with him uh, from the time of his baptism all the way to the time of his resurrection, we have seen his glory. And John reports that they were the first-hand witnesses, again, to the glory of Jesus. First-hand witnesses to the glory of Jesus. Now, that word glory has a few different meanings. It's actually a pretty complicated word in the Bible. If you, if you go through and, and do a BibleGateway.com search for glory, you're going to find a lot of different uses for it. It can mean praise or honor. That, that's what we, you know, we say we want to bring glory to God. That we want to uh, you know, sing praise and glory to God when we come together. So it can mean praise and honor. That's one, one meaning it can have. It can mean to celebrate or to rest, as in glory in the Lord. That we can glory in the Lord. We can celebrate in God. We can rest in the Lord. It also can mean magnificence. That's probably the definition we likely associate with this verse. When we think of it, uh, we think of scenes like Isaiah 6. Remember Isaiah 6? In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord in the temple high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple and smoke, and there were the angels flying around crying, Holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah, the prophet, the good guy, says, Woe is me. I've seen the Lord. That's kind of the, the picture of glory we see. Or maybe we think of the glorified Christ in Revelation. You know, that, that almost that almost scary picture of Jesus who who is his eyes are like fire and just, just the, the glorified picture of Jesus. Maybe that's what we think of when we think of the glory of God or the glory of Christ. And rightly so. Rightly so because that's the nature of the God we serve. That is a part of who God is. That is there's no question that God is glorious in that majestic and magnificent way. But I want to do a little crowd participation time here for a second. I want you to look at the person next to you. Okay, and I want you to do one thing for me. I want you to think of one word that describes that person. And please be nice, okay? John, I saw what you're, I, I saw you got nervous there when I said that because you're waiting for your wife to say something here. What's one word that describes the person sitting next to you? Somebody just shout it out. Okay, raise your hand, I guess, instead, so I can hear it again. Yes, Peggy. Kindness, Kindness describes Tolly, I assume, or, or Janice, too, probably, for that matter. Yes, ma'am. Huh? Peace. peace? That describes your dad? Is peace? 
All right. I like that. Okay. Gary, yes. Expensive. <laughs> Expensive. Expensive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I think she needs a rebuttal, but I think he meant I think he meant very valuable is what he meant there. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say loving, but now I'm gonna say judgmental. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good. Anybody else? Heather? Mental notes, never do crowd participation. <laughs> Ever again. Okay. <laughs> Why are you turning red for, Stephen? That's funny. Okay. Now, here's the thing. The, most of those words actually do describe, probably in some aspect, the people you described, right? But I got to tell you, I know Tolly. And he is, kindness does describe him. But there are some other words that describe him, too. He's wise. He's, he's uh, loving. There's a lot of, there's a lot of words. It's so, so kindness is good. And those other words that everybody uses, you know, it doesn't fully describe the person next to you, right? The reality is, is you cannot describe someone you like or love, even somebody you don't like. It's hard to, it's impossible to describe somebody with one word. Do you agree with that? Well, that's the thing about God's glory. Is when we read Isaiah 6, when we read the, the glorified Christ in Revelation, we see a truth about who he is. But you cannot say that is the extent of who he is. Those pictures of God's glory are certainly accurate. Perhaps they are just incomplete. You see that the glory mentioned in John chapter 1, verse 14, is simply this. This is how I like to define it. The glory in John chapter 1, verse 14, is God's self-disclosure in a man. God's self-disclosure in a man. In John chapter 8, a little, little bit down the road here, Jesus says that we can know the Father by knowing Christ. He says, if you know me, you know the Father. If you can see the Father and his attributes by looking at me in my life. In other words, Jesus is God's chosen way to reveal himself. That's how he wanted to reveal himself to the world, was through Christ. And in Christ, we can learn about the nature of God. And Jesus is a perfect reflection of the Father. And again, throughout the book of John, we see Jesus talking about how he can do nothing without the Father. That he only does what the Father tells him to. So he's the perfect representation, the perfect reflection. Now, this is why this is important. John chapter 1, verse 14 said that the Word became flesh and that John and the others saw Christ's glory. Then, for the rest of the book, the Apostle John describes what he, see, what he and others saw. That's what the book of John is about. It starts out with the birth of Jesus, with this passage, with this verse. And then it talks about the ministry of Jesus, the glory that they saw. You know what's missing from the book of John? Any sort of Isaiah 6 type of event. There's no triumphant Christ of revelation in the book of John. Even the event known as the Transfiguration, you may have heard, that, heard of that, where Jesus went on the mountain with three of his disciples. John was there, by the way. John was there, and they saw Jesus rise up, and Elijah and Moses joined him, and they saw the radiance of Christ in that moment. John was there, but yet he did not include that in his book. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but not in John. So there's no glory from Isaiah 6, no glorified Christ the revelation in John chapter 6. Those type of things are just missing. But what we do see in the book of John is the story of the nature of our Savior. And therefore, we, are see, we see God's glory. We see his self-disclosure in Jesus' life. And it turns out that based on what John describes as the glory of Christ, that based on Jesus' life, that perhaps the humble arrival plan may have been appropriate after all. Because here is the kind of Savior we see in the book of John. First of all, we certainly see a worthy Savior. He's a worthy Savior. One of the greatest parts of the book of John are what are known as the, the I Am sayings of Jesus. Where Jesus makes certain claims about himself and he, and he, and he compares himself to others or, or other things or objects that would have been familiar with so he can kind of describe his nature. And, and here's the statements that Jesus made about himself. John chapter 6, verse 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And so Jesus said, I am your sustenance. You need nothing else. 
You need nothing else. Maybe from a physical standpoint, if you focus just on that little that little bit of time and you're on this earth, sir, you may need to, to have food. But the reality is, is that little time of, that we're on this earth doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things if Christ is not our sustenance. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He says in John chapter 8, verse 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This reminds me of a verse we read just a couple weeks ago in John 1. Verse 4, it said, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the reality and the truth of Jesus is that he is our light. He is our guide. He is our source of brightness in a world of darkness. John chapter 10, verse 9, he says, I am the gate. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. And so Jesus says, I am the one through which salvation and peace is found. Go out to pasture. They come to me. They go to pasture through me. We find that peace with God through Christ. John chapter 10, verse 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And so we see there that Jesus is the one who guides us and directs us and cares for us and protects us. John chapter 11, first part of verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. That Jesus is the life. It is he that we can find hope for the resurrection. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so not only is he a gate to salvation and peace, but he is the gate to salvation and peace. He is the way to God. He is the truth we must base our life upon. He is the life that is promised to us. John chapter 15, verse 1, the first part of that says, I am the true vine. And he goes on to say in John chapter 15 that apart from me, you can do nothing. And so he is our source of power. He is our source of strength. He is our source of motivation. He is our source of purpose. And these are all things that Jesus is. These are all things that are revealed about the nature of who he is. And Jesus is everything we can ask for in a Savior and King and even more. And so as I said before, it probably makes sense that the Magi made a long trip to honor Jesus. That was probably appropriate, however it may have been a little understated. But, but we also see in the book of John that Jesus is an approachable Savior. We see an approachable Savior. I love the part of John chapter 1, verse 14 that said he dwelt among us. I talk about this too much. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to stop. I'm not sorry about that. I love that part, how he dwelled among us. He, he lived among us. The, the, the Greek literal, literally means he tabernacled. He pitched his tent. And you've heard me say it before, but I love the message version. that says the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Right next door to mankind. Right in their midst. And the truth about our Savior is that he's not out of reach. He chose to be amongst the people he came to serve and love. And we see throughout the book of John that he was approachable by just, just anyone. Anyone could come to Christ. There was no ivory tower to climb to get to him. There were no outer courts to traverse. He was accessible. He was right there and available. We see it throughout the book of John. John chapter 3. We read about Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to him. He's a religious leader, a Pharisee. He comes to him in the middle of the night because he doesn't want his other religious leaders to find out that he's talking to Jesus. He comes to Jesus, and Jesus not only welcomes him, but talks to him and tells him the truth, that you must be born again if you would receive the kingdom. John chapter 4, a royal official approaches Jesus because his son was near death. He's near death, and he comes to Jesus and says, my son is dying, and Jesus says, your son will be healed. And he didn't even go to the son, he just tells the royal official that he was healed, and, and it was true, it happened. John chapter 12 Mary approached him and poured perfume on his feet, anointing him. And so you see throughout the book of John, all these people coming to Jesus, the poorest of the poor, the royal officials, the, 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 the high status religious leaders. There was no one that Jesus says, nope, sorry, I'm not going to talk to you. In fact, not only did people allow people to come to him, not only did Jesus, was he approachable, but he also didn't wait for people to come to him. John chapter 4, read the story of Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman, two big no-nos of the day. One strike, she was a woman. Second strike, which actually strike one, two, and three, she was Samaritan. Good Jewish people didn't talk to them. 
And Jesus went to her and talked to her and, 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 and shared uh, himself with her. Told him her the truth about himself. And then we read that she went and told the whole village and many were saved. Many Gentiles, many Samaritans were saved because of what Jesus did with the Samaritan woman. We read in John chapter 5, a lame man was to be healed. And the lame man didn't come to Jesus. Jesus went to him. So what are you doing here hanging out by this pool of Siloam? And he says, I've been waiting for the, the waters to be stirred. If I get in, hopefully I'll be healed. And Jesus says, you want to be healed? I'll heal you right now. He tells him to get up, take his mat, and walk. John chapter 9, there's a man who was blind, been blind since birth. The man doesn't come to Jesus. Jesus goes to the man and says, you're healed. And cures him. And of course, he approached his disciples to follow him. A ragtag group of uneducated, rough around the edges, frustrating men. It consisted of rich and poor and various backgrounds and political views. And he went to them and said, come and follow me. And so Jesus was an approachable savior during his life on earth. And he's also approachable now as well. In that discussion with Nicodemus, Jesus said this. Maybe you remember it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish. Whoever is a pretty big, widespread category. So maybe it wasn't so unusual for the shepherds to be the receiver of the angel's message. Maybe God chose the shepherds, one of the lowest rungs on the social ladder, if not the lowest, to hear the heavenly message to show that the message was for everyone and anyone. I mean, shepherds were so disrespected and disregarded in that culture that they could not even testify in court because they wouldn't be considered a credible source. Not even human. Yet that's the ones that Jesus, or that God sent his angels to announce the birth of Jesus to. To show anyone, the lowest of the low, can come. And so the Savior was approachable, just like his birth hinted. But we also see in the book of John, we see a humble Savior. Of course, we see that Jesus' life overall was humble. I can't remember, I think it's uh, one of the other Gospels where Jesus said, you know, uh, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. In, 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 in essence, Jesus was homeless. He didn't have a lot of money. When it came time to pay the tax, he uh, sent his apostles to go over and fish, and they found a coin in the mouth of a fish. I mean, Jesus didn't have a whole bunch of money. He didn't have a whole lot of, a lot of uh, you know, creature comforts. He was very humble in the way he lived. But he actually, he actually never demanded what he deserved either. I mean, really, Jesus could have had a lot more than what he did. He never demanded that. He never asked for that. He never got that. But his, his humility is also accentuated in John chapter 13. You remember the story? They were eating. And then if they finished the meal, Jesus got up took off his outer garment, wrapped a towel around his waist, and he began to wash the disciples' feet. You heard the story enough to know that that was not something that, that self-respecting human beings would do. No one would choose to do that. It was only something that was reserved for the lowest of the low. The servants who were the, in the doghouse, so to speak, the ones that were the least of the, of, of the hierarchy of the servants in that house. And, and it's hard to imagine that the creator of the universe would humble himself and do what was reserved for the lowest of the servants to do. But that's exactly what he did. And it's reflected not only in the, it reflected not only the attitude he wants his followers to have, because remember he said, as I've done to you, do to others, do to one another. He so wasn't talking literally washing each other's feet, but he was saying, be willing, be humble to serve no matter what it might require of you. But it's also a wonderful picture of the humble nature of our Savior. And so maybe it wasn't so out of line for Jesus to be born in a little podunk town in a small barn cut out of a rock, most likely a little stable. Maybe it was more, maybe it was more appropriate than what I gave credit for. We also see, though, in the book of John, we see a suffering Savior. Believe it or not, the word suffer or suffering does not appear in the book of John. It's not because we don't see Jesus suffering. It's not because we don't have the story of his death and resurrection. 
in the book of John. It's, it's addressed a little differently in the book of John. Listen to Jesus' prayer after prayer in chapter 17 of the book of John. The first two verses, he, he prays this. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to those you have given him. Now, of course, what Jesus is praying about in John chapter 17 is his own impending suffering, his death. He's praying that death that he was going to willingly submit to on the cross. In that experience, Jesus would go through the greatest emotional suffering you can imagine as he, his friends abandoned him. He went through the, 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 the spiritual suffering as God turned his back on him for a brief moment. He went through uh, physical suffering, of course, as he was nailed to the cross. Physical suffering that's absolutely unimaginable to me. And when Jesus prays about that impending event, he doesn't say, Father, the hour has come. Please reduce my suffering. Father, the time has come and now prepare to suffer for you. No, he said, the time has come. Glorify your son. You see, Jesus doesn't identify those things of suffering. He identifies, he associates those things with glory. So maybe it was more appropriate than I thought that Jesus' birth was associated with suffering. Since his greatest moment of glory would come through suffering. You see, there's a reason that Jesus identified suffering with glory. There's a reason that when John said he saw his glory, that he was talking about not only Christ's worthiness and power, but also his approachableness and his humility and his suffering. There's a reason that God chose the plan for Jesus' birth that he did. Because the kind of Savior he would be was reflected in his birth. Later on, the Apostle John writes about his God-inspired vision, which is known as the book of Revelation. And this is what we read in chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 1. John writes, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. I saw a mighty angel proclaiming a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep, see. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. You see, that's what I think of when I think of the glory of Christ. Wait a second, there is someone who is worthy. There is someone who is conquered. I think of the one who is worthy of fulfilling God's plan of restoring heaven and earth to its pre sin state. I think of the Lion of Judah. When I think of the Lion, I think of Mighty. I think of the Roar. I think of Aslan from, from the C.S. Lewis writings. You know, I think of all these majestic pictures. And, and I think of the Mighty Savior who has triumphed. And that's why I kind of wish that the birth of Jesus was louder and more spectacular. Because the birth of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, or the one who is worthy to usher in the new heaven and the new earth, and the one who has triumphed, it seems to me that there should be a little bit different things in a barn, in a stable, and all that stuff that went along with it. But as the elder in the book of Revelation announces that there is indeed a conqueror worthy, we see that conqueror appear in the next verse. Then I saw a lamb looking as if, as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. And here's why that's so important. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not that God so loved the world that he sent World War III. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that God so loved the world that he sent his son as the crucified lamb. You see, Jesus wasn't born into a rich family because it was not money that would conquer all. Jesus wasn't born into a military family because it would not be military might that would conquer all. Jesus wasn't born into an influential royal family because it wouldn't be political influence that would conquer all. No, Jesus was born to a poor family in a stable 
in Bethlehem. Because God is and will be victorious, not through might and power in that form, but in the might and power that is found in a relentless, self-giving love that is exhibited by Jesus Christ as the slain Lamb of God. And how appropriate that our worthy Savior is an approachable Savior. How appropriate that our mighty Savior is a humble Savior. And how appropriate that our victorious Savior was victorious through suffering. You see, that, that makes sense. That's the Savior who was born. In Bethlehem, in the midst of suffering, without riches, without power of this world, but humble, yet victorious. Suffering and overcoming and approachable in all of that. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for having ways that are better than our ways and thoughts that are higher than our thoughts. Lord, we pray and thank You that the power that it overcome was not power of this world. It was not the power this world is used to. It was not brute force. It was not cunning words. It was not political power. It was lamb power. But the victory was won through humility, through suffering, and through an approachable Savior who invites each one of us to Him. And Lord, because of that, we can say that this wonderful story, this wonderful chapter of the entire Christmas story, this little part where the Word became flesh, where Jesus made a conscious decision to be born. And He did it, He planned it in such a most appropriate way. So Lord, as we reflect this coming week on the birth of our Savior, on the little town of Bethlehem, of the stable in the manger and the shepherds and the magi and the escape to Egypt as we reflect on that chapter of the story let us be filled with the joy of knowing of what kind of savior that reflects the savior that came to this world and whoever believes in him can be saved we pray this in Jesus name Let's stand. Just sing.